In lesson three, we also need to talk about commercial systems. So this is going to be a two-part lecture um, talking about the different types of commercial systems and some of the components that are out there with commercial systems. We have to realize that construction of com refrigeration components varies from the domestic systems in the following way. First, we might have a number of evaporators connected to a single condenser. We might have different electrical voltage. Our compressor design and size is going to be different. Condensing unit design and size is different. And motor controls, both temperature and pressure, are different. And refrigeration controls are also around. They might be liquid and vapor controls. The also varies by piping, evaporator designs, defrosting, and the variety of refrigerants used. The refrigeration components are very much like the hermetic compressors used in small commercial systems, such as beverage dispensers, ice cube makers, ice cream machines. Semi-hermetic compressors are usually used on larger commercial applications, such as multiple evaporator storage room, large fresh food cases, and multiple compressor units. Commercial systems are either split packaged or split systems as well. Packaged systems are designed, built, and shipped by manufacturers and include all components needed for complete system operation. Split systems are site engineers. Components are assembled on site. These systems are often custom designed for specific applications. High pressure sides include compressors, they're usually hermetic, condensers, air cooled, Liquid receivers when a TXV or AXV is used, high pressure safety motor controls, liquid line with dryer and sight glass. The refrigerant control is the division point between the low and the high side of the system and it consists of an AV or cap tube device. In a packaged commercial system, low pressure side includes evaporator, low pressure temperature motor control, suction line, some with filter dryers and surge tanks. Package systems with multiple evaporators are a little bit different because they have some extra components. The compressor is included with the oil separator, condenser might be water or air cooled, liquid receiver, high pressure motor controls, liquid lines with dryers or sight glasses, water valves with a water cooled unit. This is an example of a piping diagram with a package with multiple evaporators. Again, with multiple evaporators, the refrigerant control is the division point between the high pressure and low side and the low pressure side. Low pressure side includes refrigerant controls, two or more thermostatic expansion valves. Evaporators might be two or more, maybe natural convection, forced convection, or submerged. There's a motor control that's operated by pressure, serves as a low pressure control. Suction lines may include filter dryers and sight glasses, as well as pressure regulators. The low side also controls two temperature valves for multiple temperature installations, surge tanks for reducing rapid pressure changes, and check valves for multiple temperature installations. Subcooling is used on low temperature units such as display cases or freezers. The process reduces the refrigerant temperatures in the liquid line below the saturation temperature. The lower the temperature in the liquid line, the greater the system's heat removal capacity resulting in a more efficient system. Subcooling is accomplished by refrigerating the liquid line in a low temperature system. A high temperature system is used since it removes BTUs three times more efficiently than low temperature refrigeration systems. Together, the two systems increase overall efficiency of the refrigeration process. This is an example of a subcooled system. Notice our first compressor is taking care of the refrigerator directly, and then we have a second subcooling installation that's the subcooler it's a heat exchanger that's coming that's doing the liquid lines the subcooler has an external drive unit condensers are mounted on a steel base motors mounted outside the compressor the motor drives the compressor either directly or with one or more belts the system might have a hermetic compressor that is co connected directly to the compressor Crankcase and system pressures are equalized on startup to prevent the oil from leaving the compressor during the startup. Compressors may be named after the cylinder arrangement vertical, horizontal, vertical two cylinder, V type, four cylinder, etc. To shown to the left of this paper is a serviceable six cylinder W type compressor. Commercial hermetic units are usually bolted together. They're referred to as field serviceable or accessible. 
Both have service valves. Some units are sealed in a welded casing. These units may be connected to any type of evaporator. The advantage of hermetics in the commercial field is that the elimination of, of the crankshaft seals and belts. Moisture and dirt must be kept out of the system during servicing. This is an example of a commercial hermetic unit. It's an outdoor sealed air-cooled condenser, has a fan, condenser, shroud, and service valve. This, is how, this picture is one like you'd find getting coming out of a parts house. The inside of a four-cylinder welded hermetic com compressor used for air conditioning, heat pumps, and commercial condensers contain a crankshaft, a connecting rod, a piston, a motor winding, electrical terminal, suction and discharge openings. Smaller units have single phase. Units over 5 horsepower generally have three phase motors. Condensers may be installed in different rooms or outside the building. Manufacturer assembly condensing units can be matched with evaporator assemblies and precharged refrigeration lines to meet a wide range of cooling needs. For large installations, two motor compressors may be used. Tandem assembly motor compressors connects two motors, compressors together at the motor end. These units can be run separately low for low load or run together for full load. Parallel assembly motor compressors connects two or more units in parallel by piping. These units also require a compressor oil piping system to ensure all compressors have the correct oil level amount in each crankcase while operating. Outdoor air-cooled condensing units save space when air conditioning, commercial buildings, and homes. It saves cost of plumbing for water circuits. It's useful when chemicals in water makeup make water cooling impractical. They can be mounted on the roof, outside wall, or at ground level. There are four major provisions using outdoor air-cooled condensing units. There must be a head pressure control if the unit is exposed to outdoor weather below the operating cabinet temperature. They must have a method of preventing short cycling and that must be designed into the system. It also must have a means to prevent dilution of the compressor oil by liquid refrigerant and its completed condenser must be constructed and installed so it's virtually weatherproof. Low ambient temperatures can cause the head pre low head pressures which may stop the flow of refrigerant. To maintain pressures, partially fill the condenser with liquid refrigerant, stop or slow condenser fans, partially or completely close ambient air louvers, or heat the condenser. Dual compressor models contain two completely separate refrigeration systems. They range from 6 tons to 35 tons and provide a partial standby system. Dual compressor models have basic operations similar to a two-stage compressor. Each compressor is activated individually from a two-stage thermostat. They provide two-stage heating and cooling with automatic changeover. The operation sequence works like a system number one turns on the first stage of the thermostat. If the load is light, system one carries the entire load. The compressor cycle is on and off at the call of the thermostat. If system number one is not adequate to handle the load, the room thermostat automatically turns on a second compressor. It will signal on and off to carry the rest of the load while compressor number one runs constantly, removing moisture from the air. When using outdoor units, it is important to maintain full operating capacity at the thermostatic expansion valve during cold weather. Capacity depends on the pressure difference across the valve. If condensing pressure is reduced, the valve capacity will drop and not enough liquid refrigerant will flow. The fixture temperatures may rise too high and the unit will short cycle. A design change can alleviate this problem. The unit is made to nearly fill the condenser tubes with liquid. Just enough condensing surface is left to maintain the pressure. Installation specifications must be carefully checked prior to doing this. The receiver must hold enough liquid refrigerant to flood most of the condenser in the winter. It must safe, also safely hold the refrigerant during the warm season. The check valve and limiter valves ensure good condensing pressures during cold weather. Another valve method of maintaining pressures is to install a pressure sensitive device connected to the condenser tubing. This head pressure device will move the rod out as pressure increases, thus opening the louvers. The adjustable louvers will close as head pressure decreases. A system may also use a fan cycling pressure control to sense the condenser pressure. These controls lower the fan speed when the head pressure drops. Electronically controlled modulated fan speeds are also used for this purpose. The system operates with a thermistor 
on the condenser and special fan motor. Electric heating elements are often placed in and around the receiver to keep the receiver temperature warmer during the cabinet temperature. If the receiver begins became too cold, it would act like a condenser. Systems may also use a bypass from the compressor to the receiver. The bypass feeds hot refrigerant vapor to the receiver to keep it warm. The bypass has a check valve mounted in it to ensure one-way refrigerant flow. Compressors can also be kept warm by electric heating elements that surround it. They are thermostatically operated to energize the heating element at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the heater usually has 100 to 200 watt capacity. Windy conditions can prevent fan and damper operation. The unit must be installed in position to avoid high velocity cold winds. It should be built as a weatherproof as possible with walls built around it on all four sides. Head pressure control valves that are thermostat operated are usually used. A check valve in the condenser outlet prevents flow of refrigerant to a cold receiver. A system with a pressure control valve will open as the receiver pressure falls. Hot gas is allowed to bypass into the receiver at about 20 psi pressure difference, raising the receiver pressure and increasing the flow of liquid refrigerant to the evaporators. This is an example of the hot gas version of pressure control. Notice the solenoid valve for the pump down system. Notice the yellow bypass valve that allows the hot gas out of the discharge line prior to the air-cooled condenser to move into the receiver if needed. The valve has two openings B and C. As one closes, the other opens. Valve must be sized to the capacity of the system. The system is charged with twice as much refrigerant without the condenser flooding feature. A receiver that stores extra refrigerant due to the summer is needed. For service purposes, the receiver should be twice the normal size. The compressor may collect small amounts of liquid refrigerant during the off cycle and a trap may be needed in the compressor discharge line. Commercial compressors vary a little bit because they are either external drive or hermetic. There are several types of commercial hermetic compressors. A bolted hermetic compressor uses temperature limits and oil pressure sensing safety device. Large units may have winter hydraulic or electric unloading devices to control the number of cylinders pumping. The higher the load, the more cylinders are used to pump the vapor. A welded her hermetic compressor, not field serviceable, is built in sizes from 1.6 to 20 horsepower. Design varies with size in the manufacturer. Some are spring mounted internally, others use outside mounted springs. Smaller units must have one cylinder. Larger units have two or more cylinders. Small units can either be two or four pole single phase, three phase motors used in larger units. Each compressor has a maximum and a minimum revolutions per minute for efficiency. They also have a compressor ratio. That's the difference between the high and low sides. They have a discharge temperature and the volume of gas it can pump. Prior to using the compressor, check the manufacturer's operating specifications. Cascade systems are used in many low temperature systems. The first stage compressor may not be a reciprocating unit, but rotor units are also used. Rotary compressor pressure limits to about 45 psi across the compressor. Rotary has a high volumetric effect. A check valve is usually placed in the discharge to prevent backup of refrigerant during the off cycle. Check valves should also be placed in the oil lines. Compressors may have from 1 to 12 cylinders. There are numerous cylinder arrangements. In cascade systems, internal and loaders are usually operated by spring oil pressure. A spring holds the intake valve open until oil pressure builds up, causing all intake valves to operate. This is also reducing pumping capacity during low load conditions. Solenoid valves are mounted in the oil lines to unloaders. When the solenoid closes, the oil pressure drops in the unloader. The intake valves are kept open. Low side pressure switches operate the solenoids. A timer bypass switch operates the system at full capacity for a minute each hour or two. External unloaders use the bypass to the evaporator and let ensuring suction vapor is cool. In other words, desuperheating it. Air-cooled condensers are common in large commercial systems. They may be cooled by a big fan built onto the motor or into the compressor flywheel on external drive units. 
Placing metal shroud around the air-cooled condenser may increase fan efficiency. More than one fan is used. Air is drawn and forced through the condensers. The condensers have fins and frequently use a double or triple row of tubes. A variety of fin arrangements and construction may be used as well. Motor compressors and liquid receivers can also be located inside and the air-cooled condenser located outside. The compressor discharge line carries the high, hot, high-pressure vapor to the outdoor air-cooled condenser. The condensed liquid is piped then back into the building. Large commercial units can also use water-cooled condensers. These are built in three styles, shell and tube, shell and coil, tube within tube. The shell and tube condenser cylinders are usually made of steel with copper tubes inside. Water circulates through the tubes, condensing the hot vapor in the cylinder into a liquid. The bottom part of the shell serves as a liquid receiver. This is an example of a shell and tube condenser. Water inlet, water outlet. Notice the, the liquid comes out of the bottom. Advantages of shell and tube condenser include compact needs, no fans, combines condenser and receiver in one, and when manifolds and enders are removed, the water tubes can be easily cleaned of deposits. The shell and coil is very similar to the shell and tube. Water-cooled condenser has a coil of water tubing inside the straight the shell rather than straight tubes. They're often used in smaller commercial units. It's popular because it's easy to construct. Water passed through the inside of the tubes cools the refrigerant in the outer tube. The outer tube is cooled by air in the room as well. Doubles cooling improves efficiency. You'll notice when you look at the tube and tube condenser in the picture here, the cool water inlet is on the cool liquid outlet. In other words, the, liquid, the water and the refrigerant are moving in opposite directions. Another type of picture of a tube and tube condenser is shown here. This type of construct condenser may be constructed in a cylindrical, spiral, or rectangular style. There is one problem here with the uh, um, tube and tube condenser coils. You will eventually build up um, minerals on the inlet of the tubes, just like shown here when we're talking about lead that actually decreases the heat transfer. A doubled wall inner tube with a groove design achieves venting of refrigerant as a vapor in case of a leak. The tube and tube design has water entering the condenser at, at the refrigerant outlet. The water leaves the condenser at the point where the hot vapor from the compressor enters. This is called counter flow design. The warmest water is always adjacent to the warmest refrigerant and the coolest refrigerant is next to the coolest water. Cooling towers also are a water-based system. Water cooling towers save on water consumption. The towers serve the same purpose as the spray towers in larger systems. There are a variety of cooling tower designs. Cooling towers generate excessive noise due to their large fans and water spray. Therefore, they should be located away from areas such as offices, restaurants, and residences. Cooling towers are made of corrosion resistance material including steel, copper, stainless steel, plastic, and treated wood. There's a couple different cooling towers listed here on this slide. Parallel flow, cross flow, counter flow, spray filled, and deck filled. Your chapter 13 in your book will go into that in more detail. The more water surface in contact with the air flowing through the cooling tower, the more efficient the cooling action. The following factors improve performance of a cooling tower. First, design conditions, humidity requirements, tower heat load, design wet bulb temperature and water quality. A cross flow cooling tower takes the water from a heat source through an inlet on the side of the unit to a hot water distribution basis on each side. Gravity flow nozzles distribute the water evenly over the deck surface. Air is drawn through the inlet louvers and across the wet deck causing some water to evaporate removing heat from the remaining water. Cooled water flows into the large sump and returns to the heat source. Cooled water collects in the bottom of the enclosure and passes through a screen removing any additional material and the water is then recirculated through the condenser. A flow controlled valve in the lower water pans add water as needed. A drain continuously bleeds some of the water out of the pan to keep water hardness to a minimum. Chemicals are added to retard rust, algae, fungus, and bacteria. 
This is an example of a cross-flow cooling tower. Your hot water inlet, cooled water outlet, and then the water flow, flows across the decks. A fill is a material that allows water to flow over materials in thin films, ensuring increased contact with the airflow and more efficient cooling action. Fills are made of many metals. Materials, you might have metal fins, wood, slats, plastic, etc. The shapes of the fills of the surfaces vary, vary with the most popular being cellular or honeycomb. The distribution system, nozzles, troughs, v-notches must be clipped clean and must distribute water evenly to prevent scale buildup. In order to prevent cooling tower freezings up, um, you have to make sure that it's only operating above freezing temperature. Normally there's no danger of freezing while in operation. Electric high heat in the form of immersion and convection can keep water temperature up during shutdowns. An electric heater may be installed in the pump circuit to prevent freezing. Hot water or steam may be used to prevent reservoir freeze-ups. Pipes may require insulation or electric heater tape. Use only coarse screens on the pump inlets. All suction lines must be below water level in the cooling tower or air may enter the suction line causing drop in pump and volume and damage. Pump outlets also require fine screens. The water should push the system through the system to prevent low water pressures in the condenser tubes or pipes. Make sure you look at any manufacturer's literature for the details of tower sizes and capacities prior to servicing. There's one issue with um, cooling towers, and that is Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire, Legionella pneumoniae is a bacterium that causes Legionnaire's disease. It was first found in 1976 at a Legionnaire's convention in Philadelphia. During the convention, over 200 people became ill and 34 people died. Symptoms include headache, high fever, and respiratory problem. The disease is caused by contaminated cooling water from a cooling tower. Bacteria grow in the stagnant cooling tower water and then are transferred to the water sprays into the building air conditioning ductwork. Preventative measures include placing cooling towers downwind from buildings and ductwork and periodic disinfecting of cooling towers. When bacteria count is high, action must be taken to reduce levels. It is mandatory that you check state and local requirements for testing procedures. Every state will have them.